put it. Well, I'm joined now by my panel. Uh, let's see how much time I have with them. This show has been disrupted by parliamentary shenanigans. Shadow Assistant Treasurer Stephen Jones and Liberal Senator James Patterson, welcome. Good to be with you, Patricia. Stephen Jones, this looked like a tactical win by Labor, but does it have any practical consequences? This is just another government MP who became deputy speaker today, isn't it? Oh, look, what we saw in the, in the parliament today was more of uh, the disunity that's going on within uh, the National Party, which is obviously spilling over into the government's ability to make even the most fundamental of decisions. 75 members of the House, including a good number of uh, government MPs, voted for the person who wasn't the government's choice to be Deputy Speaker. Now, many people at home might be going, well, this is all just internal stuff. Why does it matter? I think Ken O'Dowd has just set out to you in uh, his explanation for why he voted, why it does matter. He sent a pretty clear message that uh, he's dissatisfied with the Deputy Prime Minister and with David Littleproud for that matter, uh, saying that uh, Queensland wasn't being properly represented in Michael McCormack and Scott Morrison's government. What's clear is uh, the disruption that we saw uh, last week hasn't gone away. Barnaby Joyce is still there in the background creating and doing his mischief wherever he can. We're going to see this disunity. It's clearly spilling over from, you know, who fills what spot and over into policy, uh, as we're seeing with the internal debates around coal, around energy and around climate change inside the party room. We've got anything but stable and certain government at the moment. James, I need to bring you in here too because the point being made there, well, it does make sense. I mean, this is not who the government wanted to be deputy speaker. We have nationals, well, one just came on the on the show and said that they didn't like what Michael McCormack did, so they decided to vote for Lou O'Brien. It does look chaotic. I don't think he can hear me, so... Oh, there you are. Uh, yeah, just perhaps some context might be useful for your viewers, Patricia, because before this afternoon it's possible that none of them had even known that we had a Deputy Speaker or what the role of the Deputy Speaker is. The primary responsibility of the Deputy Speaker is to chair the Federation Chamber, uh, which is like the overfull, overflow room of the House of Representatives where members go to speak when there's not enough time to speak in the House of Representatives. Uh, the great weight of the nation will not fall upon who is the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. It won't make any difference to anyone's job security. It won't make any difference to everyone's uh, price of energy. Uh, it won't make any difference to road safety. It is not a fundamental issue which is going to affect Australians. OK, I agree. You say, no, Can I just say no, I agree? Wait a minute. No, I want to ask the question because you say no, no one even knows who this is. OK, that sounds like, well, I'm going to call it for what it is, spin. Uh, it's the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives. This is our national parliament. It is not an insignificant position and, in fact, it's quite well paid, James. Uh, Senator, you know, you can spin your way out of it, but let's call a spade a spade. This is not the nominee of the government. Mm. And in fact, nationals crossed the floor to vote for this guy. He was not the nominee of the government. That is significant. Patricia, I acknowledge it is of great interest to people in this building and maybe in the building that you're in in Melbourne. But when I'm out in the community talking to the Australian people, they do not stop me in the street and say, hang on, who is the Deputy Speaker of the Parliament and were they the government's nominee? It really is, in the scheme of things, um, maybe, yes, a bit untidy, I'll acknowledge that. But is it going to change the course of our nation's history? I don't think so. I will bring you back in, um, Stephen Jones. Uh, will it change the course of the nation's history? It's true, not many people probably know the Deputy Speaker. So what's Labor trying to achieve here? So the point I want to make is this. In one sense, James is right, majority of Australians don't know who the Deputy Speaker is, but the real issue here is this. Uh, if you cannot even agree amongst yourselves who the Deputy Speaker of the Parliament is going to be, how are you going to agree amongst yourselves how to put in place an economic plan that is absolutely critical to the future of our economy and to the livelihoods of Australians? How are you going to put in place a plan which deals with climate change, energy generation and ensures that we don't have the devastation of the black summer of fires that we've just been through? These are the real issues. And as Ken O'Dowd has said, they see, my, they see Michael McCormack as some sort of temporary hiccup. I think they were Ken's words. Uh, if you can't agree on the basics, how are you going to agree on the big issues? James, I've got a really specific question for you. Do you think that taxpayer funding should underwrite a coal-fired power station? 
Starting from a bright basis of first principles, Patricia, I hope the end point that we get to in the future is that no energy source needs to rely on any taxpayer funds. My view is government shouldn't be in the long-term business of picking winners. What we're doing at the moment is trying to get through a difficult transition period between the take-up of renewables and the, and the phasing down of traditional sources of energy, and that has been messy and it does require some government intervention along the way. So, yes, there are generous support for renewables, and yes, we're doing a feasibility study for a coal-fired power station right now uh, in Queensland. And if the, the outcome of that feasibility study is that, you know, it, it's feasible that the Commonwealth should inject money, you'd be comfortable with that? Let's wait and see exactly what the feasibility sure, we study will, but says. But I'm asking you, just like you said, first principles, philosophically. Are you mm. philosophically comfortable with that? Well, as I said, Patricia, I think the end point that we need to get to in this country is for all uh, energy generating technologies to stand on their own feet, to live or uh, die and succeed or fail on the basis of their intrinsic qualities, how much energy they produce and how efficiently they do so. So the, the gradual winding out of government subsidies, I think, is the right thing that we should be aiming for. So you'd be uncomfortable with government money going towards a new coal-fired power station? Well, I recognise the fact that, Patricia, that a lot of government money, a lot of taxpayers' money has gone to supporting renewable energy in recent sure, years. So, but I ask about a... this project specifically. Yeah, and, and what I'm trying to point out there is, Patricia, is that uh, the government is not in a pure economics classroom here. Uh, we are in the messy business of e executing a transition here, uh, and we, haven't, we have done things which might not be completely consistent with my first principles, but I'm telling you at the end point where I think we should get. Stephen, I know Labor's saying it doesn't believe in taxpayer funding going towards uh, this project or projects, but how about if it can get up on its own two feet? There's a strong business case for it, it can do it. Would you be comfortable with a new coal-fired power station opening? Oh, look, there's a reason why taxpayers shouldn't subsidise it, and that is it's not necessary. Uh, what Australians want is reliable, affordable, sustainable energy. Uh, James talks about the transition. I agree. It's actually happening. Just like climate change is no longer something in the future tense, it's actually happening now. Um, in the time it would take to build a new coal-fired power station, you could probably build up to 50 um, solar, uh, wind, geothermal and other forms of uh, renewable energies backed up, firmed up by, by gas backup plants. So it's not necessary. I think we just should just get on, get over this silly debate, which is driven by politics, not by economics, not by energy security. Get over that debate and ensure that we can lock down uh, an energy policy and energy security okay, at so affordable that's prices. that's broad debate, but on specifically mm. new coal-fired power stations, do you think if business can do it, they should be allowed to open? Uh, look, if business, business could do it, they would have, and they haven't. No, I ask so it's you, kind of an should, academic... Should, 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 no, well, look, I'm asking an academic question, you answer it, though, okay. straight with me. Should yeah. they be opening if, there is, if they can do it, if they can stand up on their own two feet? No, I don't think they should, and here's the reason why. Um, it doesn't make economic sense. It doesn't make sense from providing uh, affordable, uh, reliable electricity. And what it actually means, and this is the crux of the point, Patricia, we will be getting, uh, we will be asking taxpayers for the next 50 years to be subsidising the generation of an energy source that we don't need because there are so many other alternatives to it that are available now. So you want a straight answer, there's the straight answer. The reason that I don't support it is that I don't want taxpayers to be paying more for their electricity than they absolutely need to. And this proposition that's been put around by Matt Canavan um, is exactly that. Taxpayers are going to have to pay more for electricity um, because of his ideological fixation on building another power station that neither the power, the, the, the finance industry won't back uh, and the country doesn't need. Thank you to both of you. It's a shorter panel than usual, but what an afternoon. Thank you for coming on. Great Thanks to be with you.